WPFR Terre Haute, Indiana. Freedom of communication of personal and controversial ideas and opinions is the foundation of American democracy. For this reason, WPFR now presents Teletalk, a weekly program whose sole purpose is to allow you to communicate your ideas and opinions to our listening audience. This is your opportunity to let your ideas and opinions be known. Your calls are now invited at 533-1661. That's 533-1661. Pleasant day to you. WPFR, Terre Haute, Indiana. We got about uh, 33 minutes after the hour of six. This is Monday, November 26, 1973, and this is WPFR Teletalk. A little time we are WPFR set aside each week so that you, our listeners, might call in and voice your opinions, ideas, and uh, observations on issues that you consider interesting or vital or controversial. We'd like to... Uh, Listen to your views. That's the purpose of this program. It is your program. So we do invite your calls now at 533-1661. My name is Bob Marks, and I'll be talking to you this evening when you call in. When you do call up, the first thing I'll ask is, can I put you on the air? We have to do this for legal purposes. WPFR, may I put you on the air? Okay, go ahead, please. I think if the people of this country don't do something about President Nixon now and impeaching, that we're going to end up just like Nazi Germany did. Uh, I don't understand. What, what do you mean? Well, he has too much power. And the things that he's done that's come out in Watergate and the energy crisis that he's making for this country is it, just a shame. Uh -huh. He just tells us what he's going to do and dares us to do something about it. They just found against him the other day on, on that court case where they took him to court over those tapes. And uh, they said that's an obstruction of justice and that they legally ruled he had no right to fire Archibald Cox, but he did it anyway. Uh -huh. What do you think we could do about it? I think he must be impeached. I think if he isn't impeached, that he won't get out of the office until he's good and ready. In other words, you think the presidency is becoming too top-heavy, it's becoming too powerful, President the Nixon? has too much power for any one person for this to remain a democracy. You know, so many people were saddened by the fact that President Nixon got all of the power to allocate energy that he did. Yes. And they thought it was getting, that was just making him a little more top-heavy. And that... Uh, uh, the reason Congress did that was because it's an unpopular thing to do, this rationing of energy and this conservation of energy, because it inconveniences people, and people don't like to be inconvenienced. Well, I think Mr. Nixon or President Nixon will do anything to get the people's mind off of Watergate, because there is so much upheaval in the country over it. My brother-in-law works for Marathon Oil, uh -huh. and he has told me that they are shutting down oil wells in this country. We have more oil than we're using now. But since we've got the energy crisis, President Nixon has ordered the oil well shut down. So we're not using all the oil that we already have. Mm -hmm. That's I really hard that's to believe that the drastic measures they're taking, but there are oil wells right around here that they're shut down. Are, are these oil wells still producing? Do they have a, they're producing. That's rather strange. What then, what, would the, what then would you say to uh, well, all of the conservation of energy that's going on in Europe now? Well, Europe doesn't have the natural resources that we did when Hitler took power in 33. The people said then, you know, that Hitler would have to stop for lack of oil, but he took countries that had oil. He had ploiasty, which at that time had about 50% of the world's oil. He had what now? Ploiasty. They took ploiasty in Romania. Oh, okay. And that was... We had the great big oil wells they bombed during the war. Uh -huh. But Hitler captured countries that had oil, which enabled him to go ahead and make World War II. But this country had its own natural resources. 
But Europe doesn't have to depend on outside sources for almost all its energy, so it really hurts Europe worse than it does the United States. They have always been much more energy conscious. Look at their little cars and things. Mm -hmm. But that never bothered the people in the United States because we always had plenty. Do you think Richard Nixon then is snowing the United States and the populace about the energy crisis? I think that there, we, we probably have used more energy than we should. But I think that he wants to play it for all it's worth to get the people's mind off Watergate because there's, there's no way anybody in his right mind can, can believe that President Nixon is completely innocent. Mm -hmm. And if he is guilty in any part of it, then he should be impeached because at any time that the President of the United States can openly defy the law, how can he expect the common people not to? Okay, now when, when did you believe that President Nixon openly defied the law? Well, when the... When he refused to turn over the Watergate tape, and then he turned them over and he has erased part of them, mm -hmm. or somebody in his employ erased part of them, because I personally heard Nixon say on the radio and on TV that he was personally responsible for all those tapes, and he would not turn them over to anybody. Mm -hmm. and now it's come out that his secretary, supposedly, she accidentally erased it. He gave them to H. L. Halderman, and he took them to his house and left them there for three or four days, and there have been several people listen to this tape, but yet the American people couldn't listen to him. Mm -hmm. And that judge in the federal court ruled against Richard Nixon and said he had no right to fire Archibald Cox, that it was unconstitutional and it created an obstruction of justice. And that's a rather serious offense for the President of the United States. Yes, it is. <laughs> and, uh, just the other day, when he said, just before this last speech he made, uh, do you mean the one this morning or yesterday's? Uh, yesterday evening on Tuesday okay. about the energy crisis. Right. That the American people would have to do without a little bit. Yet he has Air Force One, which is his own private jet, and he burned 2,200,000 gallons of fuel the day he had, or the weekend he had the press conference in Disneyland. Mm -hmm. He went to his personal home out there in California, and he went to Disneyland for this press conference. And he doesn't stay in the White House. He's always going to Camp David. How can he? How can we supposedly do without all our energy? Yet the president burns it up like it's going out of style. Because so this irritates airline fuel. Yeah, his personal jet burned all this fuel. So this irritates you a little bit, then, huh? Yes, it does. I don't understand why the president can't stay in the White House. Why he has to fly back and forth to La Costa and Florida, and why, if we're going to have a press conference, why didn't he hold it in the White House? Why did he have to fly to Disneyland? <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I listen to about all these press conferences. I think everybody should. Uh, but I thought he was rather nasty with the reporters that one he had in the White House, where he told him he had no respect for him or the news media. If it yes, was the news media, the people of the United States would not know what is going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said that he wasn't angry with them because you had to respect somebody you were angry with. That's right. Is that I right? Mean, I, I definitely believe in freedom of the press. I think it should have limits on it, but if you don't have freedom of the press, then nobody's going to know only what whoever's in power wants you to know. And I'm quite sure that nothing would have come out about Watergate if the newspapers had not forced it. I agree. I well, truly I agree. I think we need freedom of the news media. And well, uh, written John Myers and uh, Brooks By and Vance Hartke. And I think everybody should, like the senator, the senator should know how the American people feel. They cannot vote adequately if they do not know your feelings. Well, you know what Congressman Myers said? He said possibly at one time the energy crisis was uh, started by the oil companies. We, we haven't talked about that. But he says now it's a real thing, and this is our own congressman here in Indiana. Well, I know John Myers sent me a letter back, and he is, of course, not in favor of, of uh, impeachment of Richard Nixon. Uh -huh. And I was very disappointed in, in Mr. Myers or John Myers because of that. I thought that he would be because when you stop and think Richard Nixon was vice president for eight years, he's been president for going on five years now. For the last 20 years, he has been in a very high public office for 13 of them. Mm -hmm. Well, not actually not the last 20, but he was he was acting president and under Dwight Eisenhower for quite a while also. Right. And uh, that's the same thing. I don't see how these little people in his organization could have supposedly pulled the wool over President Nixon's eyes when he is supposed to be such an adept politician and he has been around for so long. So you definitely think the man should be impeached then? I definitely do, sir. I think that after Richard Nixon is impeached, the next president or any other president will think twice before he does 
anything illegal because he will know that even the presidency will not keep him from the law. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Do you think Gerald Ford should become the next president in case President Nixon is resigned, or do you think the Speaker of the House should get it? I think the Speaker of the House should be, and then I do not think that a president that is impeached or is going to be impeached should elect the next vice president. Mm -hmm. uh, if Gerald Ford deserves the nomination, that is one thing, but I do not think that Richard Nixon, if he is impeached, should be allowed to do it. Oh, okay. Well, thank you so much for calling. Do you have any other thing you'd like to talk about? No, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, there's one man's opinion on what is going on in the White House today. He believes that President Nixon should be impeached. He believes the energy crisis is being put on by Richard Nixon. Uh, I, I had heard people thinking of, of such things. Oh, they, had, they had told me they had thought such things. But usually, the energy crisis was blamed on the oil companies. Maybe, maybe it's a combination of the two. Maybe there's a lot of factors in it. What's your opinion? We'd like to hear it at 533-1661. 1661. The gentleman that just called mentioned the erasure of the White House tapes. That, of course, happened from uh, the president's secretary, Miss Rosemary Woods, who testified today that she accidentally erased part of the tapes, part of the Watergate tapes. She said she immediately informed President Nixon, and President Nixon said, well, that's okay. And as the gentleman did mention also, President Nixon has said that he will take full responsibility for the tapes. So what's your opinion on the big mess? We'd like your opinion at 533-1661, 533-1661. Again, this teletalk program is not particularly limited to national issues. We can uh, go on the international scene to such things as the Mideast crisis, or we can narrow it down here into Terre Haute, or even your own backyard. This is your program. This is your chance to let your telephone be your microphone and uh, go out over the airways at 533-1661, 533-1661. President Nixon, in his talk last night, uh, said he was going to initiate Project Independence 1980, and the purpose of the Project Independence was, of course, to make the United States independent from other countries as far as uh, fuel needs go. In other words, we wouldn't have to depend on the Arabs for our fuel uh, allotments and our, our fuel consumption. One of the most controversial things he said, as far as I am concerned, was that gas stations should be closed from 9 p.m. Saturday to midnight Sunday. This will be on a voluntary basis, as I understand, for a while, and later on will be passed into law. What do you think about gas stations being closed from 9 p.m. Saturday to the middle, to midnight Sunday? Do you think this will curtail the consumption of energy, or do you think everybody's going to go to their local discount supermarket and buy themselves a five-gallon gas can like I believe I am. Uh, do you think it's good? Do you think it will work? Uh, how, how do you think this is going to affect you? Are you going to be inconvenienced by the gas station closing uh, from 9 p.m. Saturday to midnight Sunday, or are you going to fill up on Saturday? What's your opinion on the whole thing? We would like it. Do you think there might be a better way to curtail the consumption of energy? What do you think? This is your show, your chance to voice your opinion on it at 533-1661, 533-1661. What about industry? Do you think we should uh, put a little more constraint on industry and their consumption of energy? Uh, industry uses a vast majority of the energy that is consumed in this country, as I understand. The argument against curtailing the consumption of energy in industry is, of course, the uh, skyrocketing dive of industry. What do you think about curtailing it in industry, the consumption of energy? What's your opinion? 533-1661. On the local scene, the energy crisis hit Indiana a little bit over the Thanksgiving break, especially the college students. It seems that a lot of the college students here in Indiana uh, primarily at uh, Indiana University and also at uh, ISU and the other local colleges here in town. It hit them because they couldn't get themselves a ride home over the holidays. This was, of course, because of the cutback in flights. Do you think uh, it might be better to 
have more flights, do you think this would discourage people from driving as much? We would like your opinion at 533-1661. We'd like to know how many people out there are conserving energy. Are you driving 50 miles an hour or 60 miles an hour on the interstates? Are you turning your thermostat down to 65 degrees? Or are you like some people I've talked to here at uh, WPFR who say they're going to use energy until there ain't no more, and then they're going to stop it? We'd like to know what, what you think of the whole thing. Do you think as this gentleman who we just talked to that the energy crisis is being started by President Nixon? Do you think that it might have possibly been started by the major oil companies to get their Alaska pipeline, which they now have, as well as to eliminate some of their smaller gas station competitions. We'd like to hear your opinions at 533-1661. For those interested, if we have time later on, we'll be reading you some tips on how you can save energy in your home, in your auto, and everywhere. We've talked a little bit about energy and Watergate. Uh, how was your Thanksgiving? <laughs> Thanksgiving just ended, of course. We might have a turkey shortage. I had a lengthy discussion uh, on my visit, I visited West Virginia over the holidays, and we had a lengthy discussion about the cutting of sandwiches. And it seems that when you cut a sandwich diagonally, even turkey sandwiches for that matter, when, when you cut them diagonally, they seem to taste better. I think everybody agrees with this, but nobody seems to know why. If there's somebody out there listening that can tell us why diagonally cut sandwiches taste better than uncut sandwiches or horizontally cut sandwiches, I uh, would like to hear from you. That would be interesting if somebody has any theory on that. There's, there's just something about a diagonally cut sandwich that makes it taste so much better. Oh, we can talk about all sorts of things. We've had all sorts of interesting people call here in our program. We've talked about uh, drugs extensively. We seemed for a couple weeks to have a rather large college audience from Indiana State University, and we talked a lot about drugs, about the... Uh, status of drugs, about the consumption of drugs, particularly that of marijuana and also the legalization and some of the aspects of that. We had also many calls from some of our older audience who were very much against the consumption of marijuana. So that could be something we could bring up again. We had some homosexuals call one time, one male and one female, and it was kind of ironic that there's some fascination, at least for me, about talking to a homosexual. It's something that's very alien to my nature and my environment, and it's fascinating, and it's kind of bizarre, but they were interesting to talk to. We had a uh, guy call up one time and play his guitar over the radio. We don't want to encourage that, but that, <laughs> that was something rather interesting. We've had trappers call up and say that they don't wish the, uh, the legislation for, what, the steel traps, the banning of... Uh, snap traps to go through or whatever that is because uh, it isn't humane to animals. At least this is the opinion that they expressed. And also one of our other interesting calls, we had a call from a criminology major from Indiana State University who said she consumed marijuana. This is a criminology major now. And You know, I understand the cancer, of course, is the second greatest killer in the United States after heart disease. I've had it four different times, and I don't know why they have to leave this thing on there. They promised to take it off, but but they changed their mind after the 10th month. Uh Had me still in the hospital, and it just broke my heart, and uh, I can't eat, drink juice, or eat raw fruit, or nothing like that. Uh, how does it feel to have cancer? What effects well, does it have uh, on you? I just get pains uh, in my back, you know, where your uh, shoulder blades is in the back, uh-huh. and, um, and I don't get sick to my stomach or nothing like that, but I just have uh, pains around uh, the little thing, and the then uh, I have to keep taking the liquid medicine all the time and pills for uh, diarrhea and stuff like that. That's mm. where this infects me. And, uh, oh, um, I get off a boo. It makes you awful nervous, and you have to nervous. take your pills. Oh, is that right? Yeah. But I take uh, my doctor's prescription, though. Have you, uh, you said you had cancer before. Salami. Uh, I forget how you pronounce it. Uh, 
sloppy, or I can't say it. Ain't that funny? Anyway, it's a bag you wear. Uh-huh. A plastic. And then you could wear a big... <laughs> but uh, sometimes now for two or three days, why, it's all right. It's just, just fine. Mm-hmm. If I take enough of this medicine, liquid medicine, and then I pour garlic, I pour in it. And, but anyway, uh, it's it's an awful life to live, but I'm hoping and praying uh, that it's better than it used to be. It ain't bad as it used to be. And I don't have no blood or nothing like that or no discharge or nothing, and I'm glad of that. But uh, it seems like it's changed around in the back a little bit, but yet uh, not completely, I guess, until they'd operate on me and change it right. I see. But uh, it worries you, you know. Well, I understood getting back again, you said you had cancer before. Uh, uh, were you cured of cancer? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, I was in the 53, and I was in 62, and this is the third time. Now, how were you cured of cancer? Well, I was operated on. Oh, I see. Uh-huh, and then given uh, treatment afterward. And in 62, they gave me the operation, uh, the treatment afterwards, but this time they gave me the treatments first, mm-hmm. which, uh, which I think caused me to have the diarrhea uh, with the cancer. But uh, I'm telling you, it, it just breaks you all up, and it makes you a nervous wreck sometimes. Uh, I have to take, uh, I, I cry, I get worked up, I cry when I can't get the tape on right. I use, oh, so much tape, tape, tape. Tape? Yeah, you know, tape, what you put on a sore finger. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Silk tape and cotton proof, rain proof tape, you know, and, uh, I mean, waterproof tape, and, uh, and then, oh, I have to use a spray, and... Some women never is bothered with it after they've had it 25 years and 10 years that I know that's never bothered with it. But boy, gee, not me. I I get the worst kind, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well, hoping and praying that the Lord will turn it around where it belongs uh, or they'll operate on me right. Well, you certainly have uh, uh, at least one. I love to eat and I love to bake and cook and and uh, I just can't eat no, no raw fruit or juices or pop or coke yeah. and if I drink a little bit oh my goodness it's terrible so I don't drink I can't even drink pop you can't mm-hmm. wow that's unfortunate well we we hope you a speedy recovery maybe uh oh. maybe you can get this one cured Her also music just makes me feel so much better. It gets my mind off of myself, see? The country music. I stay in so much. I don't go out much, and I, you know, your country music just gets my mind off of myself, off of the thing, you know, and that's why I love it so much. Well, that's, that's, that's the reason for radio, for entertainment, but there's an escape. It's you're wonderful. I don't know what in the world people would do without us. Yeah, that's true. I wouldn't give you two cents for TVs. Now, they're all right for people that loads them. I have 16 TVs, but my husband died, uh, dropped dead, uh, about nine years ago. Yeah. And um, he, yeah. he loved TV, but I, I liked it pretty well then, but I got away from it after I sold it. And, <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. That'll get you away yeah, from it when you sell it. From it. I, these people's got a beautiful colored uh, TV. Oh, uh huh. It's in shop already again, but uh, it's always in shop. In yeah. shop. Yeah. But, <laughs> well, I think I sure hope they get that uh, fixed up, that gasoline, too, myself. Yeah. That's terrible. Some poor guys have to walk to work and, and, and ride bicycles, and I just feel so uh-huh. sorry for them and the women. Hey, well, thank you so much for calling this okay. evening. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there's one lady, <laughs> and uh, we talked about a lot here. You're in tune with WPFR Terre Haute, Indiana. This is WPFR Teletalk. WPFR, may I put you on the air? May I, may I put you on the air? Oh, yeah, we're, we're having our talk program, you know. Oh, can I put you on the air then? Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you were talking about the speed limits um, and people slowing down, you know. Right. 
and I was driving a Tennessee, and the 75 there, you know, on the expressway, and the buses were going 80. The buses were going 80. Is that right? That's right. Hmm. And there was a tourist, a, a tourist bus, you know, and they were, uh, when we pulled out from the stop, I thought, well, I'll get ahead of them. But I got ahead of them, but I couldn't stay ahead. <laughs> Is that right? Buses were going 80 miles an hour. Yep. I had to go 85 to go around them. I went around them once, but I thought I'd let them have it. Now, you know you're confessing to a crime now. Yeah. <laughs> you were speeded on the interstate, yeah. and President Nixon wanted you to go 50. Pardon? That was fun. You know. That's really wonderful. I, I don't think as many people were as lucky. At least I wasn't. Maybe it was because I was driving at night, and many of the yeah. service stations have just decided to yeah, close down their 24-hour operation. I didn't drive at night. I drove during the day. Mm -hmm. And I got lost in Montgomery. I always do coming back. I can go through it going down, but coming back, I always make the wrong turn. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to be down there for the winter. And I, I thought I was, but oh, I had bad luck. Why? What happened? My apartment wasn't ready, and it was terrible. I wouldn't have it. Oh, is that right? And I had three people looking for places for me, but nobody had anything. Disney World has spilled out up that far, you know. Disney World? Oh, that's right. Disney World was down there. That's where the president had one of his news yeah, conferences. Well, I'm taking all the rentals, and now they're starting to build, but he said it would be, oh, a year or two years before they're finished. Have you ever visited Disney World? Uh -huh. I understand that that is one of the most fantastic places in the world. I was there last April. Mm -hmm. Was it completed then? Yes. How did you enjoy it? What I saw of it was all right. It's rather expensive. Is it rather expensive? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I was with my sister, and she was kind of late getting around, so mm -hmm. we didn't see too much. But oh, we saw the uh, House of Presidents, Wax President, the Greens. You know, that was were nice. Mm -hmm. And um, what else did we see? I don't remember now. <laughs> but anyway, we didn't see very much. It cost us four fifty to ride the monorail. All right, <laughs> that is quite. Well, I'll let you go by. Maybe somebody else will call you. And talk. Oh. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice to have you back. Bye bye. Little technical difficulty there in the end. This is WBFR Terre Haute, Indiana, five minutes after the hour of seven o'clock. We're talking about all sorts of things. Mostly it's just been a casual conversation, which is okay. This is your program, and uh, you get to use it as you see fit. Usually I like to take and have the program take its own course, which uh, it seems to be doing tonight fairly nicely. Again, we invite your calls on just about any subject at 533-1661, 533-1661. Uh, again, it, it really surprised me in driving from, again, this is from Indianapolis to Columbus, that there was not one gas station open. I started out driving slow because I thought, hey, I'm going to be conserving fuel for uh, the nation and everybody else, and it was a good thing. And every time my tank got below about uh, half a tank, I would stop and fill up. But it started to scare me as I drove onward, and any time my tank got below a quarter, I decided I'd stop and fill up, and it was a fortunate thing I did, or I might not be back here today. What's your opinions on the energy crisis, on President Nixon, on what's happening in the world? We invite your calls at 533-1661, 533-1661. This is, of course, the deer hunting season. While down in West Virginia, all of my relatives went deer hunting. I don't particularly enjoy hunting, but uh, they seem to. If there's a hunter out there that might like to explain to myself and maybe some of the, the women, I, I don't mean to tag myself as a feminine because I don't believe I am. But if there was anybody out there that would like to explain the joy of hunting, why, why, what is the joy, of the sportsman idea in hunting, we would invite you to call it 533-1661. The killing of the animal doesn't bother me as much as the physical <laughs> exertion, I guess, possibly I'm lazy. Uh, also while I down there, I had quite an experience. I, I shot a cow 
we were going to butcher it up and that divide it up among the family. I have an uncle that shot a cow all about two years back, and I understand he shot the cow. You shoot them right in the head with the 22 pistol. The cow has big brown eyes. He looked up at my uncle after he shot him, and he kind of went, Moo, and all four of his legs spread out. And to this day, when my uncle's eating beef, you can look at him with big, sad eyes and go, Moo, and he pushes away his plate of beef and excuses himself. I didn't feel any such thing, but uh, it, it, it was kind of interesting, and he's quite a character anyway. So, uh, we've talked about energy this evening. I, I mentioned all of the gas stations that were closed in my little uh, excursion. Are, are you conserving energy? Is the energy crisis hitting you in any capacity? Are you going to put up your Christmas lights this year? I believe it was Public Service Indiana. Oh, I hope I have the figure right. It was four-tenths of one percent or four one-hundredths of one percent of the energy put out by Public Service Indiana is normally used in lighting. This is an infinitesimal amount and can almost be disregarded. They say, don't worry about it. Uh, what do you think? What's your opinion? Do you think uh, Christmas lighting maybe should be banned? Do you think there should be a ban put on it? Do you think it's a frivolous thing that maybe we could get along without? Or do you think it would degrade from the spirit of Christmas. What's your opinion? 533-1661. How are you working in the energy crisis? Do you think it's effective? Again, has it affected you? Are you conserving energy? Are you driving 50 miles an hour and going 65? You know, I started out, I said I drove slow in going from uh, Terre Haute to West Virginia, and I started out at 50 miles an hour, and it was an ungodly feeling. I felt like I was crawling and, and wasting time, and it, I almost became neurotic, and I finally compromised and went there at 60 miles an hour. 50 miles an hour is awful slow, I tell you, on the interstate when you're used to going 70. Ted Ford had a good uh, solution for <laughs> the energy crisis, especially in in the city, of course, it's the installation of fireplaces. And then the question arises, what are the pe people in the city going to do with these fireplaces? And Ted said, well, they're not going to have any energy there, so they can go chop down the telephone poles and use that for firewood. That might be interesting. How was your Thanksgiving? Did you have any particular exciting thing that happened over Thanksgiving? Did you get your 15-point buck when you went deer hunting? Let us know. Let the world know. 533-1661. We'd like to hear from you. This is your program. This is your chance to tell the world what you feel and your opinions and your ideas. We have 10 minutes after the hour of 7 o'clock, and we'll take your calls for another five minutes, then we're going to take a break for news, and then we're going to come back with a little more teletalk until nobody else wants to call in. lady that called in two calls ago mentioned about the Skylab. We had a discussion last week that it was rather ironic that every time a Skylab rocket went up that we had bad weather here in Terre Haute and generally all over the place. The Skylab thing bunched off and uh, we had rainy weather last week and we just had a couple of tornadoes and it, it, it's rather interesting. <laughs> I mentioned also last week that I recall reading in a book called Stranger Than Science. I don't remember who wrote it but it was a fascinating book on uh, stranger than fiction, truth is stranger than fiction type of material. And he did a research on major storms that seem to occur after major wars. In World War II, the Korean War, as far back as the Civil and Revolutionary Wars, after a big war and lots of firing and thunder and everything, that there seemed to be weather. And it also maintained that this was the method that was used by some of the rainmakers. They used to bring out their cannons and pound on their big bass drums, and the possibly the noise was something that disturbed the atmosphere. And also, as I mentioned before, Ted Ford said he heard on the radio, possibly on ABC News here at WPFR, that uh, scientists have done research by way of satellite and have concluded that all that man has done here on Earth, this includes... Uh, Hard. You talk to Doug Haldeman because he doesn't think it's very hard. He's done it about 50 or 60 times. The poor kid just couldn't put the dag going things down, and he became very neurotic as a result. Uh, that might be something else we could talk about that just entered my mind, which I'll relate to you right here, and that is the advertising of cigarettes on uh, radio and television. I noticed on one of the local stations are advertising a cigarette dispenser for Christmas. 
Do you think it's fair to ban cigarette ads and cigarette advertising and allow such things as uh, cigarette dispensers to be advertised on television? They, of course, banned the advertising of the little cigars, which were becoming prevalent. We could also talk in a similar vein about one of my pet peeves, which I've tried to get bought up here on Teletalk, but uh, nobody seems to want to call in about it. And that is television and the, the waste that television has become. I, for one, am a television addict. I can sit down, I can turn on the TV and waste an entire evening watching situation comedies and cheap mysteries. Possibly these aren't uh, the worst things that are on TV. I think the worst things that are on television are the commercials. And I wasn't aware of this until, <laughs> this is ironic, until I saw a special on television about what commercials try to do to you. For one, they try to breed on your insecurity. In other words, if you are starved for love, the uh, motion picture will try, or the, the advertisement will try to say, if you use their product, you'll have love. And the res as a result, it seems that the average television viewer is a little more neurotic than other people. For, for example, uh, there was one commercial that said, there, look at that pretty girl and meet her without my toothpaste, or a mouthwash, I think it was. That's utter, utterly bizarre and utterly ridiculous. And as you watch it, you don't think it affects you. But upon viewing this uh, special again, I realized how much it had messed me up. And I just wanted to maybe pass that on to you. Do, do you agree with that? Or do you think uh, television is a fantastic media? I believe that there are certain good things on television. I enjoy watching a good movie or watching the news. But generally... It's uh, pretty bad stuff. This, again, is my own opinion. What is your opinion? That's what we're interested in at 533-1661. Do you watch soap operas? I, at one time, when I was very small, about six or seven, got into one soap opera and watched it for about three years, and I don't think anything happened. But uh, it, it was kind of good to kill the time. What's your opinion on it? 533-1661. You can call up, and we'll just let you talk and express your opinion on it. 533-1661. 533-1661. Oh, let's see. The Boston Strangler died, as you know. DeSalvo, who was declared mentally incompetent, has allegedly been murdered. And this brings up an interesting point, which is capital punishment. DeSalvo, of course, was uh, admitted to prison, I believe, because he was considered insane. He, had, he was a schizophrenic. He had the split personality. Do you believe such people should be cared for by your tax dollar, or do you believe they should be disposed of? WBFR, may I put you on the air? Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Boy, hey, we're good. This is Rick, right? right. Rick, Rick Ingerman, how are you, Rick? Just fine. I hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. Yeah. How was your Thanksgiving? Oh, pretty good. Uh, I, like everybody else, I think, uh, wasted some energy this weekend going on a personal trip, you know, back home. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of interesting. I, I was trying to, uh, on the way back to State of Curiosity from Indianapolis to Terre Haute, I was driving about 50. And, you know, there was only one other person on the whole highway who was going 50. Is that right? That I could see, you know. Everyone else, zoom, 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 by. Well, you know, it's one thing for everybody to go 50, and it's another thing to reduce your speed limit. Like before, I was used to driving at around 75 miles per hour. Right. Because I understood that policemen, if you're going between 70 and 75 miles an hour, that uh, they'll give you the benefit of the doubt. They'll let you pass. If you're going between 75 and 80, it's up to them whether they have to meet their quota or not or how they're feeling at the time. And above 80, they're required to stop you. This is uh, hearsay, secondhand type of information, but I've never had any trouble with it. Well, I, I once got uh, a warning but, yeah. for 80. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well, at any rate, uh, again, I, I was used to driving 75. So as I mentioned, I tried to go 50 miles an hour. But it seemed to be such a slow process, so I kind of compromised myself and went 60 miles an hour, which for me was a reduction of 15 miles per hour above my usual. Right, right. Well, you know, uh, I, I agree with you that uh, 
the whole thing, you know, they, they can say, well, overnight the speed limit's going to go down to 50, and, and I honestly don't believe people are going to drive slower, but I think just by saying that, gee, we do have a shortage, and gee, uh, you know, driving slower is going to prevent it, I really think people are going to start driving slower. Now, I, I was noticing around Terre Haute some of the local Terre Haute people, uh, like tonight I just drove from uh, down at Honey Creek out to uh, 46 here, and uh, I was noticing some of the local Terre Haute people pretty well sticking to the 50 mile an hour range, mm -hmm. pretty close to that. I, I've noticed that before, so I think, you know, that's a good sign, but I think it's going to take some, a while for people to get used to going 50. 50 seems so doggone slow. Yeah, it does. It really does. It's unfortunate, too. Uh, you know. right, right. <laughs> but I think people are going to have to realize that. I, I think the American public, most of the people that call in here don't believe that there is an energy crisis. Can you believe that? Uh, I think there is. I don't know. This is my own personal opinion. I don't think anybody perpetrated a hoax as big as the one that may be uh, perpetrated, may now be, which is now being perpetrated, if it indeed is a hoax. Well, I, it's just I ungodly. I don't believe that it's a hoax at all. You know, I, I think it's here. Uh, some of the stuff that, uh, you know, in hindsight, you can always look back and say, well, why didn't uh, the oil company do this, or why didn't the government do this, and so forth. And, and uh, yeah, you can always say that in hindsight, but it's, it's awful hard ahead of time to, 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 you know, see what's going on and to, to react in a manner that's going to prevent what's going to come. I think the only clear example I've ever seen of that is uh, the environmental situation with pollution and so forth. And it did get bad for a while, but, you know, with the results of what we've had, pollution's been cut down pretty, pretty much, I think. And uh, uh, it's going to continue to be cut down. I think, you know, the more people we get, we're still going to be able to... Uh, control it, whereas before it would have uh, kind of gotten out of control. I think this is kind of the same type thing. Well, you know, pollution is going to have to be sacrificed a little bit. We're going to have to pollute a little more because of our energy crisis. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily 100% convinced of that. Is that right? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, a lot of people were talking about, uh, I, maybe we will, I, I'm not sure. A lot of people were talking about uh, power companies having shortages and so forth. Well, I, kn I know around here we're not expected to have a shortage. Uh, and in fact, uh, surprisingly, in the Midwest, at least in the Indiana, Ohio area, uh, the same thing. Most of the energy is generated, I guess, by coal as it is now. But some of the other power plants on the East Coast, I, I guess, you know, are uh, of other types of energy. I'm not sure exactly what they are, but. Their uh, backup systems are high sulfur coal, and this high sulfur coal is polluting. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, though, if people are willing to cut back on their electrical needs, if they're willing to turn their electrical heat down to 68 degrees, and if they're willing to cut back on uh, some of the lighting displays and so forth, that, you know, really that can make the difference, and maybe we just won't have to uh, start polluting anymore. You know, it, it's a whole matter of uh, how much you want to sacrifice, you know, kind of give and take thing. Yeah. This is WPFR, Terre Haute, Indiana. Uh, are you a little chillier? Yeah. Have you turned on your thermostat at all? Well, <laughs> I live in apartments, so I, I can't legally turn down my thermostat, but uh, uh, we have ways of making it go down. Uh, opening the windows. <laughs> well, we have a little grill over the top of it, and there's little slits in the side of the grill, and you know, a screwdriver in the slit. And it's a, a, has your apartment complex reduced the temperature at all? No, as a matter of fact, they had. But uh, I have a thermostat in my room, and I've reduced it too. So. Oh, you do have individual thermostats. Well, there. no, I have the whole floor, so everyone on the floor is going to get cold. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they'll come to you and uh, no, I, yeah, I don't think you. they will because it's been like this for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So I don't haven't you know haven't heard any complaints yet. My landlord doesn't know that it's that low. But, uh, Do you think Christmas lights are a big cut in the electrical expenses? Uh, I'm not sure the Christmas lights are, but I think you know that certainly when you get all these lights out there. They do draw some electricity. I, uh, President Nixon, I, I was lucky I did hear the catch his speech last night. I thought he brought up several good points. Um, in this area, of course, 
uh, public service has been saying there is no shortage of electricity right. mm -hmm. and, and so forth. So maybe it doesn't make any difference, but he is proposing a ban on outdoor lighting uh, other than signs at places of businesses. Uh, and, I, and I heard one newsman add that were open, but uh, the president didn't specifically say that. He said at home offices of places of business. Yeah. And so I would assume, you know, you know, a, a lot of these signs uh, that are up billboards and so forth uh, cut down the electricity there. Signs maybe uh, above the expressway for gas stations and so forth, maybe get them turned out when they're not open or something. And, and I think in the long run that's going to save power. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to have to have some drastic curtailment, I guess. President Nixon, of course, proposed a, what, a 15% cut on available gas? Well, what he, what he did, Bob, the way I understood it, and again, sometimes I hate to be critical of the, of the media, but sometimes I think the newsmen just do not listen to what the president say. Now, last night he said that, uh, uh, that a 15% cut in production of gasoline, mm -hmm. but that... Uh, petroleum would in turn be used to create more heating oil. So, you know, it's kind of a compromise. Yes, you're going oh. to have less gas, but okay. you're going to have more heating oil. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's not that uh, he, he's saying, hey, let's stop it. Uh, he, he's kind of saying, well, let's uh, divert it to a different area so at least we'll have uh, not quite as bad a situation in the heating oil. I see. In other words, sacrifice driving a little bit for home heating. Right. right. Oh, I see. And when you uh, think about it, which is really more important, you know, I, I expect, you know, if you had a choice of going on uh, pleasure drives or something and uh, keeping halfway warm in your home, you know, mm -hmm. you, you'd rather keep warm. But, uh, well, it'll be interesting to see what, fi what, what finally happens. Well, you know, it's uh, hard to say. I like President Nixon's idea of becoming independent. And by 1980, I, I would question whether it's possible because uh, of America's growing needs all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somewhat limited resources, but uh, or somewhat overused resources, you might say. You know, the one guy, your first caller was mentioning that a lot of oils, oil wells and stuff were being shut down. And... I've, I've found that out, too, but the way I understand it, a lot of the oil that was coming from this is like high sulfur oil and stuff that uh, would normally be used to generate things that uh, are not in great need now, and they're shutting down those oil wells so that the uh, refineries can work full force to give us the things that we do need. Apparently, the refineries uh, is, is where the real backup is right now, where, you know, where it's this is uh, WPFR Terre Haute, Indiana. We have about... Uh, yes. what, do you, what do you think about President Nixon's uh, policy, Project Independence, 1980? I think that the independence of the United States is a very good thing, but I think that if the president was impeached, that the oil crisis would be over much quicker. Is that right? I definitely do. Now, I why is that? What, what connection does the president of the United States have with the energy crisis as far as the, the reasons for the... ...that he is taking are going to actually materially help the energy crisis. They're not. No, I, I do not think they will, and I think there are several people who have said the same thing. I think he is doing more to really upset the nation and scare the nation than he does actually help the nation. What do you think we could do um, besides what President Nixon has suggested? Do you think there would be better measures? Yes, I'm not a particularly smart enough person to know what those are, but... Uh, I listen to the president's speech, and in fact, I take the president's speech, and I can play it for the fellow if he'd like to hear it. But he did say that they were cutting back home heating fuel 15%. Mm -hmm. They were cutting back industry, industrial fuel, 10%, and they were cutting back businesses 25%. Mm -hmm. Now, they're going to cut back on gasoline in order to take the fuel oil that would be, the crude oil that would be turned into gasoline into heating fuel. Right. Mm -hmm but I do not agree with cutting down the speed limit. And if so, I don't think that the trucks should be allowed to go faster than the cars. The trucks and buses are not more economical than cars. And anyone that knows anything about engines knows that. Well, the idea, I think, is, is number one, that the trucks are the people that, uh, that 
we move, across, move all of the merchandise around the United States. So this is this is going to be a big boost in the economy to let them go a little bit faster because we'll get the machinery, uh, the mechanics of the economy chugging a little bit faster. That will be allowed for it by the faster speed limits. Uh, second of all, the, the bus is going faster. Well, that I don't understand because your buses are for sightseeing and travel between you know cities, mm -hmm. and you don't find people going to work on them type of buses. They're going to different parts of the country, and that's supposedly what we're supposed to be curtailing is pleasure driving, vacations, and stuff of that sort. Well, that that is a good point. City buses, if you follow some of them, sometimes you can see how well they, they do on fuel economy. <laughs> They just about gas you out. Yeah, that's for true. But I imagine that there are going to be a lot more people taking the bus because of the airline cutback, the cutback in flights. Yes, I think so. And a lot of this is going to be for business. Now, hopefully, I, I guess ideally it would be better if you could cut out the travel altogether and have your uh, have things done by phone, have your business transacted over phone. However, if people are going to travel for pleasure, and they have to travel for pe pleasure, I think maybe you'd have to agree to be better to take the bus because you get more passengers per mile, if you will, than you do in a car. I would think, just offhand, maybe maybe that isn't the case. No, I think you're right, but uh, it, uh, the way I understand him from talking to his speech, he wants us to stay home instead of just traveling around. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I don't think that the president should have the right to tell people when they can open their business and when they close their business. To me, that's awful risky business. Do you think the president then is too powerful? I definitely think he is too powerful. I think, in my recollection of history, I can't remember any president having this much power. It's getting close to what Franklin Delano Roosevelt possibly more than he had when we were at war. And we're not at war. Does it scare you at all? It does, very much so. I think it scares any student of history. Really, this is, this is following awful close the guidelines that uh, Hitler laid down when he went to power. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not identical, but several things that, that Nixon has done have been the same type of moves that Adolf Hitler took when he got to power. Hmm. And, uh, I mean, it's not, they're not going to walk in one night and say that it's all over with. It's going to be a military dictatorship. It's going to come little by little, but if a person just remembers what it was like when Richard Nixon first got in, and little by little what has come that he has gotten in. I don't think it's only Richard Nixon. I think the last few presidents, each one has uh, gotten yeah, more and more powerful. I think each president has gotten a little more power. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's just one man, but I think it's a, it's a state of affairs that keeps, to get, uh, keeps getting worse with each president. I think it's time that uh, the American people stopped it and we got back to what they used to have back in, when we formed this country. Which is to be run by the people, and he was roaster, supposed to represent us. Mm -hmm. Or with what to do? Uh, I don't know. I think it, it's it's a time where every American has to to sit down and think about it instead of just let the other guy do it. Do you think the president should be impeached? Then, I imagine. I, I I definitely feel he should. Uh, I think that uh, that he just dares the American people to do it, and think they won't have the courage to do so. And, I think I'm going to have to agree with him. I don't think the people in this country do anymore. On the whole, they seem to, well, let George do it. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I don't know. There's never been a vice president taken out before either. And that's already happened. Yeah, that's true. And I think, uh, as you do, as you stated, I think initially that uh, as a result of the media. I, I, uh, I'm very unbiased towards the media. Maybe a little too much, though. But I think on the whole, they, they usually represent the the people's feelings, and they're the only the only source that the American people or the world is really going to have. And I remember when this uh, when this first came up in the Washington Post first started their series of articles on Watergate, Richard Nixon filed suit against it, and he lost the suit is the only reason it ever got out. He sued him for slander, and they proved it was true. Oh. <laughs> so therefore, there is no slander. No. And. Uh, I just don't think that if it hadn't been for the Washington Post and the other newspapers that started this, it would have ever gotten out about Watergate. As a man that's connected with oil, to change the subject a little bit, uh, do you favor gas uh, rationing, or do you think they should increase the tax on it? Well, I believe that uh, 
probably increasing the tax would be better than resting because uh, I, I don't know of any really fair system they can come up with. Uh, like, I drive quite a ways to work, yeah. and if they ration gas on me, I'm going to be out of a job. Working at a refinery, do you get your gas at a discount rate at all? No, I do not. You don't? No. I bet you that irritates you now. <laughs> it really does. You think, that, well, I mean, I'm there, I'm doing it, I ought to have the first crack at it. Yeah. That's like you can't tell me the guy that delivers home heating well is not going to make sure his home is serviced before everybody else is there. Uh -huh. But uh, I have to go buy mine at a gas station. Well, uh -huh. uh, I guess maybe that's only fair. Well, yeah, it is only fair. <laughs> I agree, but... Uh, It seems to be the consensus tonight. I wonder if uh, the consensus this, I can't even say the word, that the majority of the American public has yet believed that President Nixon should be impeached or should he resign. Uh, I personally believe that if it comes up to a point of a question of impeachment versus resignation, they should have impeachment because the impeachment proceedings will bring out the facts in the case as to whether the president was actually innocent or guilty. I, for one, think it's unfortunate that uh, former Vice President Agnew resigned without being brought to trial and letting the facts come out in the open. And this, of course, is my opinion. We would like your opinion at 533-1661, 533-1661. I guess there's been a big rush on the sell of sweaters for this winter, for the supposed cold that is going to come on us all. And uh, I imagine a lot of people are out in the wood chopping down firewood for their fireplaces to keep warm this summer. In, uh, lieu of the energy crisis and the heating oil shortage. President Nixon, in one of his new news conferences previously, has said that he is going to put a lot of money into nuclear research, into uh, building up these nuclear power plants to supply us energy, which in my mind would be a fantastic thing if we, if we could get it going. There's been a lot of argument, especially by the ecologists, against nuclear power plants. One of them is, uh, the major one is, of course, the pollution, primarily radioactive pollution. These radio, these nuclear power plants put off radioactive waste. They have to dispose of them some way, and the ecologists maintain that this is going to pollute the environment. Another form of pollution that the nuclear power plants are alleged to give off is heat pollution. In other words, they have to run rivers, if you will, to cool down their reactors or whatever they have in the nuclear power plants. And as a result, it raises the temperature of the river. And in some way that I don't particularly understand, it upsets the balance of nature. However, on the more positive side, according to relativity, as you may or may not know, I'm an engineer and I've, I had a little relativity in college, but if you took... Uh, well, let me start at the beginning. At one time, they believed that matter was conserved, that if you had a hunk of matter, there was nothing you could do to it to get rid of it. You could burn it, uh, you could stamp on it and smash it all around, but when you got done, if you took all the parts of it and put it together, you'd still have the same amount of matter. It was called the law of the conservation of matter. You cannot create or destroy matter. Even when you burn something, if you bring all of the carbon dioxide that you burned and uh, put it back, you could reconstruct the, well, you couldn't reconstruct, but if you bind it all back and weighted, it would weigh the same. This is the conservation of matter. On the other hand, you have the conservation of energy, which maintained that if you had energy, there was nothing you could do with it. You could transform it into another part of energy. For example, electrical energy going in a light bulb transforms electrical energy into heat and light. It's transforming energy. However, you could not destroy energy. Energy is always going to be here. Okay, you cannot create or destroy energy. This was called the law of conservation of energy. So you have these two laws in classical physics which says you cannot create or destroy matter, and B, you cannot create or destroy energy. Well, Albert Einstein came along with his famous E equals MC squared and say, hey, these two laws belong together because really matter is energy and energy is matter. Matter, in other words, everything around you that you can touch and feel, that, that is considered matter. All that is is condensed energy. 
And as a result of this formulation, they created uh, the hydrogen bomb or the atomic bomb, which they dropped on Hiroshima. And that big explosion in Hiroshima resulted from a few ounces of radioactive material being converted into energy. In other words, matter being made into energy. We violated these old laws which says you couldn't create matter or destroy matter, and you couldn't create uh, energy or destroy energy. What they did was destroy matter and make energy. Now, in the same vein, uh, we could theoretically take a lump of coal and convert it completely into energy. In other words, take the mass of the lump of coal and convert it directly into energy and have enough energy to run New York City for about a week. Of course, this is all in theory. They're having a lot of problems with uh, the practical end of it as far as efficiency and such go. They need uh, radioactive things to uh, transform them into energy. Yeah? Do you want to say something? Okay. There was somebody hanging around my back here. This is WPFR Terre Haute, Indiana. As I was saying before, you can take this lump of coal, create it, into energy, destroy it completely, and have enough energy to run New York City. The problem is in the control of this energy. The Hiroshima bomb was a few ounces, okay, just a few ounces of radioactive material that was converted to energy, and there was a heck of a lot of power there. The problem is is control of it, and of course the efficiency of it, and as we mentioned previously, the pollution aspects of it, which were radioactive and uh, heat pollution. So that's the little point I thought I would throw in as a engineer. <laughs> We'd like your opinion on the energy crisis, on Watergate, on what you did over Thanksgiving. Did you get your 15-point buck, or did you kill a doe and get fined $500? Uh, we could talk about any subject worth discussion at 533-1661, 533-1661. While we're waiting for our next call, I thought uh, it might be nice to read over some tips that you could use to conserve energy. These are energy conservation tips in homes and apartment. Number one, check your house for insulation. Number two, make sure your home is properly sealed. Weather stripping around window frames and doors can save you from 10 to 30 percent on your annual heating and cooling cost. And as a result, 10 to 30 percent of your fuel consumption for your heating. Seal cracks in your roofs, floors, and walls. Close the fireplace damper when not in use if you have a fireplace. And store storm doors and windows. The less expensive way to insulate windows is excuse me, to seal them in clear plastic sheeting. Also, heat or cool only the rooms you are using. All but the last of these, just say, once you get heat in your house, try to keep it in. So that's uh, maybe a nice rule of thumb to remember about uh, warming and heating your home or apartment. For the winter, uh, you're asked to open your draperies during the day at the windows which let the sunshine in. Even when it is cold outside, sunshine brings warmth into the house and close the draperies in the evening to keep the warm inside. Keep your thermostat set at the lowest comfortable temperature during the day and lower the thermostat setting when you go to bed. Put a lot of sheets on your bed too. I used to have a great-grandmother. She used to put so many daggone sheets on the bed, even during the summer, that you, you couldn't put your toes up. You had, you had to sleep with your feet on the side, and it was rather uncomfortable. She would have really enjoyed the energy crisis. Maybe she would have killed everybody with the weight of all the covers. Who knows? I'm purchasing, or not purchasing, but uh, in the use of major appliances, this is... These are some tips on how you might conserve energy this summer. Have your furnace checked once a year and change the filters frequently, frequently doing, during their use. Home air conditioning filters should be cleaned every 30 days. Air ducts should be kept free of obstructions. I don't think we'll have too many problems with air conditioners using up too much energy this winter. Freezers should be defrosted when there is one-fourth of an inch of buildup of ice. That's rather interesting. I guess refrigerators would use a lot more energy if you had a lot of ice on them. Clean the lint filter in your clothes dryer regularly. That's one word I can't know how to say. And also, when possible, dry your clothes outside. When, uh, when you're cooking, you can save energy by matching the pot size to the burner size and keep the lids on your pots. Don't overpeep. Every time you open the oven, it will lose 20% of its heat. 
And generally, some ways to conserve energy are repairing a hot water faucet that drips. That'll save a lot of hot water for showers and baths and save you the energy it would take to heat the water. Lights, televisions, and radios should be turned off when not in use, and fluorescent lights use much less energy and last longer than common incandescent bulbs. This was this energy thing we were talking about. Incandescent bulbs transform a lot of the electrical energy into heat, whereas uh, whereas incandescent, or rather fluorescent bulbs, convert most of it into uh, electricity. No, I mean into light. I'm confusing. I'm trying to think about queuing up this record here at the site. Hey, we'll be back with a little more of our program in one minute. Chester, mm. do you know what day today is? Your Wednesday office. Hello, may I put you on the air? <laughs> Hello, may I put you on the air? Yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, well, why don't you uh, quit bowling off about the... Uh, do you have your... Excuse me, sir. Do you have your radio on in the background? Yeah. Uh, could you turn it off? It's awful confusing to talk and listen to yourself at the same time. Okay. Well, why don't you quit bowling off about Nixon and that gasoline and put the country music on? You don't uh, like the talk program, I take it, then? No. Why is that? Why, uh, you've got too much of it on. Well, don't you think that people should be able to voice their opinions? Why, yeah, they have, yeah, but you, there's just too much of it. There's too much of it. We only set aside one night a week. But uh, you carry it on for how many hours, though? Well, we carry it on until uh, people stop calling in. Oh, uh, and my personal opinion, I, I favor a program such as this because I think uh, the average person doesn't have an outlet to express his opinions and ideas. And there are some very good ideas that come from the small person. And very much can be done from a small person if he is concerned about some individual aspect of the society. Well, uh, I think Nixon's done too much, and I think he should be re impeached. You do think President Nixon should be impeached? Yeah. Because he's uh, he's more or less uh, mis uh, uh, he, uh, what he done uh, during the, his first campaign. He said he's going to bring the war to the end right away. See, right, which he didn't. Well, he finally did get it to an end. I think everybody yeah, has to at least admit years. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, about four years. Yeah. Well, supposedly he brought us peace in Vietnam with honor. I don't I don't know if he did or not. Uh, he might have. <laughs> I guess it's just for everybody's own uh, opinion. That, that's uh, misleading the people, you know. What's that? When he said that he had a, a secret way of ending that war. And he, he didn't. You know, that's right. I do recall the President Nixon said he did have a plan for ending the Vietnam War, but he didn't want to tell anybody about it because it would ruin the plan. Uh, that was in his campaign, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, what do you think happened to it? Do you think that was uh, deceit on his part, maybe? Well, I don't know. And I know uh, during World War II, uh, uh, during World War II, when uh, Roosevelt was uh, president, and his vice president was uh, Truman. Remember that? Uh, no, I wasn't around then. Well, he wasn't around. No. Uh huh. Uh huh. What about it? Well... Uh, sir, can I ask you to turn down your radio, please? Just a second. Please. Okay, fine. We do ask that when you do call in that you do turn down your radio because it is very confusing to listen to yourself talk and uh, and talk also at the same time as this gentleman has had problem doing a little bit. And he's turning down his radio now. Okay, go ahead, sir. It seems that he hasn't turned his radio down. I don't know if you listeners can hear in the background, but it is still going on. Maybe he has to go into the other room. Hello, sir? Hello? Yeah. Okay, you finally got your radio down. Yeah, finally got it down. Okay, now what were you saying about Roosevelt and Truman now? Well, uh... Uh, Roosevelt, uh, he had he had that war going on, didn't he? Was that World War Two? Yeah. Okay. And then uh, his vice president was uh, Truman at that time, wasn't it? Uh, okay. I, if you have your history correct, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, he had a he had about four different uh, vice presidents. Uh-huh. Garner and Wallace and and uh, Schumann. Well, uh, uh, Roosevelt died in office, didn't he? Yeah, right. And then Truman got put in, and uh, he wasn't overly all familiar with what was going on in the presidency, and he was confronted with the A bomb decision and on and on. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it wasn't that uh, Truman uh, didn't become a prize, uh, president very uh, long after uh, Roosevelt uh, died. Right. He, he, he brought that war to the end right now. Truman would. Yeah. Uh huh. How would have Truman handled it, do you think? Well, I think he uh, he threw a big bomb on them, and he was going to bomb them clear out in the into the ocean. You think then Truman would have dropped a big bomb on Vietnam? Huh? You think he would drop would have dropped a big bomb on South Vietnam? Oh, it helped. Uh-huh. Don't you think that possibly the Soviet Union would have retaliated with another bomb on? Uh, North Vietnam or South Vietnam? I'm sorry. We're getting our North and South mixed up. Yeah. But don't you think the Soviet Union would have retaliated with another bomb? Well, I don't know. They might have, but they didn't. <laughs> well, we didn't drop the bomb initially by George. No. I mean, these are things presidents have to take into consideration. We, we have to figure out and take into uh, consideration how the Soviet Union and our enemies are going to act because they're near p- as powerful as we are. And they can do us grave damage if we don't uh, watch it and we irritate them enough. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. So may- maybe Truman would have done it, but maybe we would have had uh, World War Three too. You know, th- these are just arguments. It's sometimes fruitless to argue about ifs. Paul Harvey said that if Truman was alive and we- he was questioned about Watergate, that we wouldn't have the Watergate situation today. Yeah. And I thought this was rather interesting. Uh, President or Truman would have been at the uh, at the news conference, and somebody would have asked him, uh, "Mr. President, there has been people in your employee who have been doing things that are, are illegal to get you reelected." And Truman would have answered, "Well, by George, I hope so." He says, "But if they did it and uh, they got caught, they're going to have to pay for it, and that would have been the end of it." Yeah. I've heard so many people say that President Truman was a very good president. I don't know. I wasn't alive. I don't think I was alive during his administration at all, though. Yeah, he was He was kind of a, oh, I don't know, he's kind of hard at that, uh, Truman was. You know, he he had the slogan that if the, if the heat was too hot, why, get out of the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you, <laughs> yeah. Do you think then he would have gotten out of Vietnam then? Right away. Yeah. What do you think a Truman would have done about the energy crisis? I I really don't know. I don't know what he has done about that. Mm-hmm. I really don't. But he made a pretty good president, though, at that. Yeah. I've heard so many people say, I, again, I'm not familiar personally with it, or historically even with his administration, but uh, this is just second-hand information passed on me by my parents' generation. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for calling, sir. Well, thank you. Oh, okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, there was a gentleman who called initially to express his discontent at our talk program and then went on and expressed some of his views. That's what we invite you to do now at 533-1661-533-1661. And uh, we have about three more minutes until we have news. We can uh, accept the call and talk to you for a little bit. I can't put you on the air. Okay, go ahead. I'll try to relay the information to our listeners. You, you say the previous gentleman that called in uh, called the ball me out and ended up thanking me. <laughs> did you enjoy that, I take it? You did. <laughs> quit, quit laughing. You'll make me laughing. It doesn't sound good. Thank you so much for calling. Okay, bye-bye. She thought it was rather amusing that the uh, turn of events had happened at the last gentleman to call. Who expressed some of his views? He, uh, I don't know if he said it or I said it, that Truman was a good president. He did say that Truman would have put a stop to Vietnam on the Vietnam situation. You know, it's unfortunate. Kissinger, of course, patched up North and South Vietnam, supposedly, and did get the United States out with, quote-unquote, honor. 
and we're sitting back at home now in the Vietnam War of course is flourishing again in its entirety which is rather unfortunate I do believe okay uh, we don't have time for another call to talk to you to any length if you have something quick to say we would invite you to call at 533 otherwise we, we would invite your call during news to reserve your place in line or after news whichever suits you best this is WPFR Terre Haute, Indiana. Before <laughs> of course, we don't have to particularly talk about the energy crisis. We can talk about other subjects on the international or local scene, for that matter. We have in the past talked about things that are happening here in Terre Haute, including uh, the renovation of downtown Terre Haute. It seems, as we mentioned on our last talk show, that Many of the major cities are, if you will, rotting from the center. It used to be that the major cities in the middle were the business and the, the heartbeat of the city. But suburbia came across. Everybody began moving to suburbia. And as a result, the inner city started rotting because everybody was moving from there into suburbia. The merchants began setting up uh, branch stores in modern malls such as we have here in Terre Haute, such as Honey Creek Square, which I imagine is one of the biggest competitors of downtown Terre Haute. Do you think it's fair for Terre Haute to spend your money to benefit downtown Terre Haute, to build it up, to make it more accessible? Or do you think possibly that uh, your money is being wasted that really it benefits you in no way? What's your opinion on it? We would like it at 533 we also mentioned before about the uh, possible plans for slant parking down in Terre Haute, and we've talked on a previous talk show about uh, the possibility of maybe putting parkades in Terre Haute. What these are are very, very large buildings that can accommodate many, many times more cars than can just a single parking lot. In essence, it's just a parking lot stacked upon a parking lot upon a parking lot up to as many as uh, 20 or 30 stories. They do have such big ones, for example, in Cleveland that I am familiar with, and it takes you about a good 10 minutes to drive to the top of them. Do you think this might be a possible solution for downtown Terre Haute's parking problem, which is rather bad? Or do you have any other ideas that you'd like to share with us? We would like your opinions and comments at 533-1661, 533-1661. The consensus, of changing the subject a little bit, the consensus of the, of the people that have called in tonight have been in favor of the impeachment of President Nixon. Uh, what do you think about this? Do you think that President Nixon should be impeached, or do you think that the man is doing all that he can and that he was true and he was honest when he say when he said that he was declaring executive privilege in uh, not releasing the Watergate tapes. Do you believe Rosemary Wood, the president's personal secretary, did accidentally erase the tapes? Or do you think this might be some higher plot to uh, suppress some of the Watergate evidence? What's your opinion? would like to hear it at 533-1661. We'll give you about five more minutes to call in if you'd like to. Again, this is your program. This program is for you. It is for people to call in, express their ideas, their opinions on just about any issue. We, we've, we've allowed discussion of quite diverse issues here in our Teletalk program. And if you think that it is not necessary to call in, if you have nothing you'd like to voice, we'll just go back to the country music because this is your program. And if you don't feel like you'd want to say anything on it today, we'll, of course, go back to the country music. However, we would like to talk to you. When you do call in, I'll ask your permission to put you on the air. This is a legal thing. And also, when you do call in, we ask that you turn your radio down, because if you don't turn your radio down, you're going to have problems talking to us. So again, 533-1661. I watched a program on The Late Show the other night, and we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. WPFR, may I put you on the air? Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Oh, no, this is this is Teletalk. Do you have your radio on? Uh, in other words, I can speak on whatever I want to speak. Right. May, is your radio on? Uh, no. Oh, it isn't. Okay, maybe that was here in the studio. Okay, go ahead. Well, uh, I've been uh, wondering about all this here uh, oil crisis. The United States is worried about the oil crisis. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I have a remedy. If we would treat the Arab countries as good as we do Israel, we would not have uh, lost their oil to us. Oh, that's for true. Now, uh, every country has a feeling and a story of how they want their neighbors to act and how they want to uh, feel towards each other. Now, uh, we have to realize that the Arabs are human beings, too, with mm-hmm. feeling, feelings of their own. While we are pro-Israel, let us be pro-Arab, uh, too, and they will know and realize we are a country for all people, not just a few selected people and a few selected countries. Now, somebody arguing against you would maintain that the Soviet Union is supporting the Arab countries, and therefore us, as traditional enemies, if you will, of the Soviet Union, are uh, obligated to support Israel. And well, also, that's true. I don't say we. Uh, I don't say we shouldn't support Israel. I don't mean that. Okay. But I mean we should support uh, the Arabs and realize that they have uh, feelings too. They have their own story to tell. See, uh-huh. and uh, as you uh, well know, that even though uh, Russia is helping out the uh, Arabian countries and we're helping out Israel, at the same time. We are fighting like the devil to get good with Russia and have Russia good with us. So that uh, holds up my theory. Yeah, I, I do see your point. Or aren't we doing this, in essence, and trying to work out a peace settlement in the Mideast? Well, I think I think we're doing about all they can do, maybe, for the time being. But uh, it's just thought, thought to remember that all enemies don't stay enemies. In other words, you can take Japan. They were our worst enemy at one time. Now and they're Germany. one of our best friends. Yeah, right. So uh, just be uh, humanize things a little bit, and I think it'll all come out. Well, you know, Japan has switched their foreign policy in favor of the uh, what do you think? Arab countries. Japan has switched their foreign po- policy in favor of the Arab countries because the Japanese economy would well, collapse without Arab oil. It's, uh, it's a necessity for some country that doesn't have enough oil and uh, enough products of their own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, uh, they were forced to do that, and uh, I don't think they made a bad move. Or what, uh, do you think the United States should do a similar thing? Well, I wouldn't want them to give up Israel, but I, uh, I want them to be a little kinder to the uh, Arabian countries, too. Do you think we're too mean to the Arabs? Then? No, I wouldn't say mean. No, that's not the word for it. Inconsiderate? Uh, maybe not considerate enough. Do you think that this would uh, curtail... You see, the... the worst trouble with this thing is that back for years and years and years, those countries have fought. First one's in power, and then the other's in, uh, out and so forth and so on. Okay. But uh, we're living in a different generation now, and uh, they're going to have to settle down and uh, get along with each other, and uh, it's, uh, it's it'll all come out. You think so? I think so. I hope so. What do you think? I don't know. I, I'm no, a... I'd like to ask your opinion. What do you think? Do you think uh, we should be a little more considerate with the uh, Arabian countries? Well, first of all, let me give an idea, okay? This is WPFR Terre Haute, Indiana. No, I'm, I'm afraid I have to be a little pro-Israel. I don't know if we're, we are treating the Arabs, uh, what, inconsiderate, as you say, because, again, I think the Soviet Union is supplying the Arabs with all of their machinery and their, uh, their war machine, if you will. Uh-huh. And that, as a result, we have to support Israel just no, we don't, have, we don't have to. We almost do because we, we don't bit. have to. We wouldn't have to do that at all. Uh-huh. No more than we would have to uh, uh, fight for some other country or help them out. Yeah, well, my major concern, I am a, uh, a Christian, if you will, I guess a rather fundamentalist by most judgment, yeah. and, and it concerns me a little bit with the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, of course, uh, according to scriptures and Christianity, the Jews are God's chosen people. Right, and well, who is God's chosen people? <laughs> Don't Jews. get me into the Bible here. Oh, okay. Well, you <laughs> asked, you asked my opinion, and I'm uh, we... God's chosen people. When you stop and think about it, uh, uh, those same people that's over there now uh, probably isn't God's chosen people. They've come from all over the country to make a country of their own over there, or all over the world. Yeah, you're saying about Israel, then? Yeah, or Israel. Mm -hmm. Well, see, this was prophesied in the Bible. It said that Israel, which, of course, existed in uh, biblical times, if if you will, it was prophesied that when Israel split up, that someday Jews from all over the world would recombine and reform Israel, which has happened. And then it says near the second coming, 
that uh, the world would fight Israel. The entire world would be against Israel. And you can see things pointing toward this because of the major powers that normally would side with Israel are going toward the Arabs because of the oil boycott. And, uh, you know, things are just pointing to this. And it, uh, th this is my main concern. Th this is my opinion. <laughs> okay. And possibly a lot of people listening might think that my opinion might be a little corny, but it is what I do believe. Yeah, that's true. You have... Uh your opinion, other people have theirs, everybody That's right. has the right to opinion. That's right. As long as it's halfway in the uh, realm, realm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well anyway, uh, I, uh, I'm glad I got to talk to you, and uh, of course there's only one thing I can say. Uh, as long as you have something to uh, offer people that they want, why the... Uh, Arabian country seems to be in the driver's seat on that angle. That's true. That's true. We're going to be hurting because of their oil. Of course, uh, they, they don't supply that great a percentage. It's only Well, what? the United States is not going to hurt that much over it. I think, uh, uh, I think the United States is, uh, they're blowing it up all out of proportion. I don't think we're going to hurt that much. Uh, for instance, like around here, they say we're not going to hurt for electricity. Well, I, I believe that uh, there's other ways we have of getting oil. And with what we've got in Canada and so forth and so on, uh, I just don't believe we're going to be pushed in that tight a corner, even if we don't get any oil from uh, Egypt or any place down through there. So you don't think it's really going to hurt us that much? You think the whole thing's being overblown then? I think it's being blown over, over, overblown. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I I don't mean that we don't have trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, there there is a shortage without a doubt, but I don't think it's as bad as what uh, it seems to be. Because mm -hmm. it's just like anything. Uh, uh, if you throw a little scare into somebody, why you just and then somebody says something else. First thing you know, you're just a bunch of scared people. Yeah. And boy, if there's anything that's going to scare you, is when you can't get in your automobile and drive. You'd rather do without food, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people would. Truly. Yeah, that's right. At that. Yeah. Well, well thank you so much for calling okay, in. Okay. Nice talking oh, to you. Okay. Bye, bye, sir. Bye. Okay. We'll be back with. Uh, few more comments and hopefully a few more calls in one minute. Did you ever want... Fact is, Social Security has changed our lifestyle. For more information, call any Social Security office. WPFR, may I put you on the air? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I don't think we'll have time for it this evening. Uh, was it on last week? Oh, it was. How about that? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, that was a gentleman who wondered if album time will be on tonight. Uh, album time, what we do is normally at around 7.30 or 8.30, we choose an album, usually one of the uh, most recent releases, and we play the album in its entirety. And usually I do this on uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and it's a very rare thing, I think, on radio to hear an album in this entirety, so we might put a little plug in for that and invite you to listen to it. And that's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and sometimes Friday. Sounds like a good name for a song, doesn't it? This is WPFR-FM, Terre Haute, Indiana. We have about 25 minutes to the hour of 8 o'clock. And this is our Teletalk program, <clears throat> excuse me, where you're invited to... Speak out on things which concern you at 533-1661, 533-1661. Before the last call I was mentioning, I, I watched a movie on The Late Show last night. and was It was with, uh, it wasn't last night, it was a couple, couple nights ago. It was with Richard Woodmark and Sidney Portier, and it was about uh, a, a, a racial type of thing. And it brought to my mind some of the conversations I have had with people who maintain that... Uh, in applying for a job, for example, that they have been treated unfairly because of a parallel black applicant who was favored because of his race. Uh, and I've, I've heard so much of this that uh, I, I was just wondering if it was true if anybody out there has had any experiences like this. Or do you believe that uh, maybe the black community has to be favored a little bit? What, what's your opinion? on such things. Do you think that the blacks are melting into society? Do you believe that minorities are melting into society as the Equal Rights Amendment has uh, wanted it to be? What's your opinion on that? We would welcome it at 533-1661, 533-1661. 
I guess while we're waiting for our next call, if there is a next call, we can read you some more tips on how to conserve energy. These are kind of interesting. They're, they're little ones. They're obvious, but maybe subtle. <laughs> maybe they're not so obvious. Maybe they're a little more subtle. Uh, this is one if you're buying or building a house. You're supposed to check for adequate insulation. Three to four inches on the walls and six on the ceiling are adequate for almost all regions in the country. For a new home, the added cost of installing more insulations will be returned to you within a few years by saving on utility bills. In other words, spend a little money now and save it in the long run. Uh, for clothes washing, make sure that your water heater is set no high, higher than 140 degrees. Wait until you have a full load to wash clothes. Use the coolest water practical. Of course, hot water is more expensive than cold water because it takes energy to heat water. Now, the following are some energy conservation tips in transportation. Uh, number one, I guess, probably the most important is use your car only when you need to. You're asked to walk or take public transportation or ride a bike for short trips. Create and support carpools for transportation to work, school, or shopping. Check the possibility of taking a bus or train for out-of-town trips. These are some things that you can do to conserve energy if you so desire to conserve energy. Some people, it seems to be the consensus here tonight that most people believe that uh, we are not actually faced with an energy crisis, that the whole thing is being overblown a little bit. The first gentleman that called in this evening maintained that President Nixon had uh, initiated the energy shortage to cover up the news media's coverage of Watergate and to kind of suppress Watergate and President Nixon's unpopularity. If he did so, in my opinion, I don't think it was too successful because I think people will get more down on the president when he starts uh, suppressing the consumption of energy. You might hear in the background a siren. I guess somebody has had a fire or an accident in the residence of the WPFR studio. If you have any questions about the operation or running of uh, WPFR, we'd be happy to answer them and talk to you about them at 533-1661, It's interesting. The radio station itself is on the wing of a house, and the owner, Mr. Ford, who also owns WKZI in KZ, Illinois, which I imagine a lot of you country music fans close to the Illinois border are familiar with because uh, they have more radio listeners in for WKZI than they do for the major radio station here in town. We could talk about radio if you'd like, uh, the operation of WPFR, WKZI. If you'd like to ask me anything, uh, we would welcome it at 533-1661, 533-1661. We had a call before uh, a couple talk shows ago about the call letters of stations. We mentioned, if you notice, that every radio station, every television station, every CB station, every ham station in the United States has call letters that begin either with the letters W or with the letters K. And the reason for this is because a long time ago in some long forgotten room in Geneva, Switzerland, they held a conference of all the major nations in the world and they passed around the hat and each nation drew a letter, or two letters rather. The United States drew the letters K and the letters W. The gentleman I was talking to when we were talking about this uh, said, oh, yeah, all the stations west of the Mississippi start with K and all of them east start with W. And I said I wasn't certain. And this isn't the case because I know there are stations that start with K over on the uh, east coast. But as a result of this meeting in Switzerland, every radio station, every television station, every uh, CB every ham, every, every electromagnetic communication station in the United States has call letters that begin with the letters W or with the letters K. Uh, the three or the two or three letters that follow it sometimes stand for something, sometimes they don't. I don't believe the ham call letters uh, stand for anything. WPFR stands for Paul Ford Radio. Some of the stations in town that I'm familiar with, WBOW, BOW stands for Banks of the Wabash, uh, WTHI radio and television stand for Terre Haute, Indiana. WAAC, this is interesting. According to Mr. Ford, WAAC got those letters because they wanted to be listed first in the phone book uh, under radio stations and television stations. And there was a station already in the United States with the call letters WAAA. And there was also a station in the United States with call letters WAAB. So 
they filed for the call letters WAAC, and that's how they got uh, their call letters. I thought that was kind of interesting. thought I might pass it along to you. I'm not sure of any of the other call letters. WTWO, I think it's obvious what uh, the television station stands for because they are channeled too. We can talk about radio. We can talk about uh, national things, international things, and we'll give you about three more minutes to give us a call here at WPFR and voice your opinions on what you'd like to talk about. 533-1661 is the number. 533-1661. We had uh, a call one time about a gentleman... Uh, who maintained he saw a flying saucer, and he described it to us. And it was rather interesting. He, uh, he, he maintained he saw this thing, and that it did strange things, and he saw extraterrestrial disks in the sky, if you will. And uh, a lot of people don't believe in it, and a lot of them do. And I think what we're going to do is take this call. WPFR, may I put you on the air? Oh, go ahead, sir. Okay, go ahead, sir. I just wanted to say I was enjoying your program again tonight. Oh, well, thank you. You called in last week, didn't you? Yeah, I've listened three weeks in a row now. Oh. And uh, I look forward to hearing it every week. Oh, you do? And uh, every week it seems like there's some new uh, things that comes up. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's the purpose and of it. You don't know uh, what's going to happen each week. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I try to let the thing take uh, a course of its own. In other words, have people call up and talk and uh, have them suggest topics that might interest somebody else and then have them call up. However, the response hasn't been so good in the last uh, three or four weeks, so I, I've kind of had to sit here and talk to myself a lot. Uh, I enjoyed uh, your discussion just while I go about the, the call letters. I never realized that's what the, you know a lot of them stood for. Yeah, it is rather interesting. Uh, you know, I didn't understand how they got them and things, but... Uh... It was kind of interesting to uh, to hear about that. And you know, it's uh, it's a funny thing because most people have interesting stories, little tidbits, little miscellaneous things that may not be significant, but they're interesting. And it'd be so nice if they could call up and maybe share with us a story like this. Have you been watching the weather lately to see how it's uh, yeah things has been affecting it? Well, I, I told you Ted Ford, who uh, lives here at WPFR, said he heard on the news that scientists have done. Uh, research about the satellites, uh -huh. and, with satellites rather, and they have come to the conclusion that, uh, let's see, all, all that man has done here on Earth, including all of this air pollution, and this would of course include the Skylab rocket going up, mm -hmm. has not uh, affected the weather appreciably. In other words, it's been very insignificant. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Ford, we mentioned this before also, uh, said that sometimes they have to wait for good weather down in Cape Canaveral before they blast off. Mm -hmm. Right? And it seems that bad weather usually follows good. I'm not familiar that much with the weather, but it seems reasonable. And as a result, when they get good weather down there, we're having bad weather up here because it's kind of following it down. Yeah, it, it goes in a big circle. You can you can check the, the weather. I, I like to watch the wind. Faith is the wind's blowing out of the south for a couple of days. Uh -huh. Then when it does change, it goes over to the northwest, and then it comes back around the north, and then it's back over to the east, and then it's back around the south again. Just makes is a, that right? It just makes a big circle, and whatever the weather is down south for a few days, then it, it picks it up and just brings it right up around. You, you mean the... Is this just in Terre Haute? Is this from your own observation? Yes, I just, uh, you know, just looking at the weather map and the paper and things, you can just kind of kind of go a bit. And, uh, like, if it's raining down south, well, maybe in tomorrow or next day, it'll, it'll be up here. It'll pick it up and bring it around. And if it's snowing or something up in the northwest, well, you just watch it in a couple of days, it brings it right on around. Well, it's interesting. Maybe, I never not in the, maybe not in the capacity that it's doing it down there because it kind of, fizzles out, you know, before it gets here, but we usually get the tail end of it anyhow. In other words, the weather from the south kind of comes up here and affects us then. Mm -hmm, yeah. Is that what you're saying? Well, according to that, then, it seems that after the blast off that we would get good weather instead of this inclement weather after the blast off from Cape Canaveral. Mm -hmm. Well, you just never know. <laughs> it's just something funny. Yeah, it's bizarre. That's interesting, though, about the wind going around in a circle. Uh, about the energy crisis now. Yeah. Uh, one good thing about this is it's going to take a lot of these great big automobiles off the road. <laughs> yeah, that that'll be good. I don't think anybody will miss that too much. I don't. I had a, I had a big Pontiac, and we just traded here a couple of weeks ago, or about a month or so ago now, and we got us a small car, small American Motors car, Hornet. Uh huh. And uh, it's kind of crowded for the family, but no no more driving. What we do, it uh, we don't we're not in it that long of a time to get all cramped up. 
Just like last week, I only used nine gallons of gas. So. <laughs> and how much would have you used in the larger car? Oh, I might not have used 15, 16, anyhow. So you did consider quite a bit. This is only a six. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it uh, makes a lot of difference. It's easier to park, easier to handle, get around with. But it's a little crowded, you say, huh? Yeah, uh, basically with uh, five or six of us. But uh, we make it all right. We, we get the job done. Mm -hmm. Something that's interesting, my parents recently bought a trailer, and I have an aunt and uncle that also have a trailer, one of these mobile tra campers, I guess they call mm -hmm. them. And I guess uh, pretty soon that you'll be able to pick up campers at a dime a dozen. Oh, yeah, because people, people will have no gas. They can't go nowhere with right. uh -huh. This is really going to affect the economy, I think, in strange ways. Well, and even and even next summer, see, most of these campsites, you have to hook up to the water, you have to hook up to the electricity. Right. Mm -hmm. And these will be higher because, uh, you know, there'll be less of it. Right. And uh, or at least they say there won't be no shortage of electricity, but they never know. Yeah. Because that's one of the commodities that uh, right here in Walbys Valley we're kind of blessed with is electricity. Yeah, that's right. We I understand. There's power plants all around us, and, and coal, most of them uses coal. And they, you know, they already had their contracts bought for years ahead, mm -hmm. and so they're going to have plenty of coal. So uh, it seems like we're kind of blessed with that. We may not have to worry about turning our lights out anyhow. Well, yeah, that'd be good. It really would. Yeah. Uh, I notice also there's a lot of uh, states that are kind of withdrawing inside each other, mm -hmm. with, withdrawing inside themselves. For example, Texas says that they're going to meet their oil needs. I Well, first of all, thank you for putting this video clip together. Uh, it's fun to listen to this almost 39 years after it was recorded. Things back in 1973 were different. But something really, really struck me that there's a lot of things that actually kind of remain the same. Um, one is the degree of government intervention. Back then it was Nixon with the energy crisis and whether he was going to do a federal mandated closing of gas stations in order to save gasoline. Uh, Nixon was also the one, I believe, back then that changed the speed limit on interstate highways from 70 miles per hour to 55 miles per hour. Um, today, the debate uh, on intervention of government has to do with um, things such as the health care, Obamacare, for example. To what degree should government be involved in those sorts of things? Uh, there, uh, there was also a, a commonality on the effect of man on the weather in the world. Uh, back then, we heard in the program that there was a study by satellite that showed that um, that showed that man had really no effect on the weather. And today, it's the talk about global warming and things of that sort. Energy is a problem back then. I, Nixon had an oil independence program, and uh, Obama has an oil independence program. It's kind of like the war on poverty. There's the old joke that there was a war on poverty, and the war on poverty was lost, and poverty won. Well, we have a war against, uh, against big oil and the dominance of oil in our society, and uh, we've lost that fight too, apparently. So that's something which goes on. Uh, there's also Monday morning quarterbacking on how we should fight a war. Back then it was Vietnam, today it's Iraq and Afghanistan and how we should do things and how the president screwed up and what the president did right. And something which I think is probably going to be with us for a long time, it was true back then, it was the Mideast policy. How pro-Israel should America be? We have that same debate today. 
what should be our balance of um, uh, of allegiance to Israel and the Arabs and the Persians that exist in the area. Uh, so that was one of my one of my takeaways from listening to that. Uh, a second one was the uh, incredible impact of the effect of the FCC regulations and the fairness doctrine. Less regulation has made talk radio a lot better today than it was back then. The fairness doctrine said back then, if there was a presidential campaign and we gave an hour of programming to Reagan, something which was pro-Reagan, we had to give an hour of pro-Jimmy Carter uh, also. I mean, that was just what the fairness doctrine said. Uh, it sounds good, but it's one of those things that stifles strong opinions, and fortunately it was done away with by Ronald Reagan, and hopefully will not be reinstituted. And the other thing was the FCC said at the time, since the bandwidth, the, uh, the radio station license was obtained from the federal government, that the government should have some sort of say in what the radio stations do. And that, that probably makes sense. But back then, they, they, they said that citizens should be able to talk on the radio uh, about anything that they want to talk about. The result, as you heard in this program, was kind of disjoint and unorganized programs. And it's another example of bureaucrats who have never played the game trying to make the rules and because of their inexperience in the area, total, totally screwing things up. So because of the loss, or because, of, because the FCC regulations are gone, before, because the fairness doctrine is gone, we now have interesting talk shows. We now have the Rush Limbaugh's, and we have the Sean Hennedy's, which I think are just fun to listen to. And it's good that, uh, it's good that these regulations have been taken away so that we can exercise our freedom of speech rights uh, a little more effectively. And then the last thing I noticed in listening to myself, one is always most, uh, most observant of one's own actions when watching a recording, is how naive I was. I had soft stances on politics and, uh, and different things, and I, I, I have really developed, and I think matured, and now I'm solidly on the right. My religious views are more solid, and it makes me wonder how naive today's young reporters and journalists also are. They, were pro they are probably naive now, like I was then, with their kind of either soft or liberal sorts of views. Well, being in talk radio was a blast to do. It was hard to believe that this is almost 39 years ago. Thank you for putting together this video, and thanks for caring for my comments.